I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 18 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Thorpe. That the, uh, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I give notice today that I propose to move that, in the opinion of the Senate, the following is a matter of urgency. That the Glasgow Climate Pact, agreed to by nearly 200 countries, including Australia, resolve to pursue efforts to limit global temperature rises to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels, which, according to the International Energy Agency, would require no new coal mines or new gas fields and is consistent with respecting, promoting and considering the rights of First Nations and Indigenous peoples when taking actions to address climate change. Is the proposal supported? The proposal is supported. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly, and I call Senator Cox to move the motion. I move this as a matter of public urgency. Uh, I rise to acknowledge and thank three brave environmental warriors who are right at this minute in 35 degree heat putting their bodies on the line to stop works today at Woodside's Pluto project in the Burrup, working to stop the environmental criminals. This morning I smoke, spoke to Petrina, a mother, a school teacher who has locked herself to a concrete barrel inside a caravan to block the Burrup Road, the only road into Australia's biggest gas hub. Alongside her is Elizabeth, a grandmother, and Caleb, a 23-year-old school teacher who is chained to a concrete barrel under a car. The lands of the Murujuga people make up are made up of five language groups, so I pay my respects to them, their elders past and present, and their emerging leaders. Murujuga always was and always will be Aboriginal land. The word Murujuga means hip bone sticking out in the Nyalama Yambara language and consists of a narrow peninsula of land as well as 42 islands located near the town of Dampier in the Pilbara region of Western Australia. For First Nations people, land and people are connected both physically and spiritually. There is a belief among First Nations people that if country gets sick, damaged, degraded and polluted, then they too will become ill and might even die. By protecting the land, the people are also protected. Everyone is responsible for looking after country, even non-First Nations people who live and work on this land. This is not Woodside's land, this is not BHP's land, and it's not the state government's land. This is our land, and we have looked after this land for thousands of years. We have been the custodians of the ancient Murujuga rock art, which depicts the Seven Sisters dreaming story that is etched into the rock. We know that when people fight for nature, nature wins. We saw this at James Price Point. We saw it when people were locked onto tractors to save the Beelia wetlands to stop a highway through that beautiful and precious wetlands. A campaign, by the way, that Labor supported and protected. So we know that Labor can protect the environment, but they only do it when they get votes to win elections. Why can't they do it all the time? I'll tell you why. It's because of donations. Woodside donates $220,000 every year to both the Liberal and Labor parties. In a statement to the Australian Finance Review, Financial Review, Labor Resources spokesperson Madeleine King said the Scarborough pro project was consistent with a global move towards decarbonisation. Pretty much that sounds like a line straight out of Woodside's playbook. Is Woodside writing talking points for Labor or are Labor writing talking points for Woodside? It's anyone's guess. The Greens are the only party that are consistently turning up to protect nature, to protect Aboriginal cultural heritage and to reduce the dangerous polluting emissions that are cooking this planet. On Monday, the state Labor government's support of Australia's biggest polluting gas project paved the way for Woodside and BHP to give the final tick of approval for the Scarborough gas project, which will generate 1.6 billion tonnes of emissions, equivalent to 15 coal-fired coal power stations every year. There's a groundswell of opposition coming together 
against this project, including investors. The world is turning against oil and gas and the extraction of fossil fuels since the Glasgow summit. We know that Japan and Korea are transitioning out of gas. Any suggestion by Woodside CEO Meg O'Neill that this project will assist in decarbonising the planet is blatantly untrue. There is no credible evidence to back that up. Today, I was taking a look at Woodside's Indigenous Communities Policy, which was released, funnily enough, in August 2020, so not that long ago. And unfortunately, I had to laugh with horror as I read the policy because it couldn't be further from the truth. post and caves, where lots of corporates made statements like this, Woodside claim that they will be guided by the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. They will ensure their management of cultural heritage is thorough, transparent and underpinned by consultation and continued engagement. They will avoid future damage to cultural heritage and, if avoidance is not possible, minimise and mitigate the impacts of consultation with communities. They will also support self-determination, economic empowerment and cultural heritage protection. To me, this is an absolute lie. Now we are witnessing Jukun Gorge in slow motion thanks to Woodside's obsession with fossil fuels. In my conversations with community, I have seen no evidence of Woodside upholding UNDRIP and protecting cultural heritage. In fact, what I have witnessed is the, the exact opposite. This is nothing short of gross negligence, and these governments and companies will have to answer to our kids and their kids for generations to come. They are the criminals here. And to Petrina, Elizabeth and Caleb, I say thank you because you are the real change makers. Thank you, Senator Cox. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, again, I uh, thank those in the corner for their MPUs. They're like Dorothy Dix is to us. They set up uh, a, a, a debate which we're very, very happy to have. The Morrison government is the only party in this chamber with a whole of economy, long-term emissions reduction plan that will see us meet and beat our 2030 target and achieve net zero by 2050 without imposing new costs on households, small business or our traditional industries or the economy. Those opposite will, will tax their way there. We know that. They've done it before. They'll do it again. Those in the corner will just blow up the economy. Shutting down fossil fuels overnight would just kill the economy. Loss of jobs would be enormous. Poverty would be rife. All the things that they pretend they argue for, we would see in Australia overnight. The Prime Minister took to COP26 a plan to achieve net zero emissions by 2050 in the Australian way, and that is looking at where we have strategic advantage and where we can easily make the easiest and biggest gains with the least amount of money. And by money, we're talking about incentives to partner with other levels of government and business. We will act in a practical, responsible way to reduce emissions while preserving Australian jobs and taking advantage of new opportunities for industries in regional Australia. The government will not support the Greens' reckless and economy-destroying climate policies that will force industries to shut, projects to be delayed or cancelled and destroy Australian jobs and industries. Labor, if elected at the next election, and there's a big if, will have no choice to bow to the Greens' bidding. And we hear that from the Greens every day in this place, how they say they need to be the balance of power party in this parliament. And we've seen what that would cause. Australia's economy is almost unique amongst developed countries, with an economy specialising in the production of energy and emissions-intensive commodities. That's why our proportion of non-export emissions is incredibly low. Ahead of and during COP26, Australia worked closely with our Pacific family to come up with uh, ways to bring about lowering emissions while building their resilience 
and funding any needs that they have. We particularly welcome the outcomes on the international carbon markets and the standardised transparency framework, which was a major focus for Australia, because transparency is, is the key to accountability and to translating ambition into achievement. And this goes to the heart of the Paris Agreement, which relies on countries delivering on their commitments to achieve a global net zero outcome. Australia's, Australian, Australia's emissions reporting and transparency is the gold standard, and we expect all major emitters to display similar levels of transparency. As I mentioned before, the, uh, uh, in, in our area of the, the world, through the $104 million Indo-Pacific Carbon Offset Scheme, we're working with our regional partners to build the capability of their emissions accounting and reporting capabilities. Strong transparency and integrity standards are vital to ensuring carbon markets deliver real and verifiable emissions reductions. Australia has doubled its climate finance commitment to $2 billion over the next five years. More than 70 per cent of our support is focused on climate resilience and adaption. At COP26, countries committed to scale up cooperation to make low emissions technologies the most cost effective and reliable option available. We, the technologies that we need to reach net zero don't yet exist, but our technology, energy technology roadmap maps a path to meeting, finding those technologies, bringing down the costs such they're competitive, and ensuring that we, Australia, and the rest of the world have the technologies available to us to significantly reduce emissions and decarbonise our economy. Analysis by the uh, IEA, the International Energy Agency, shows that half the global reductions required to achieve net zero will come from technologies that are not yet ready for commercial deployment. The China, the world's largest emitter, has not yet put an, an, an end to building thermal coal generation and production. In fact, in the first half of 2021, the country announced that they were going to build 43 new coal-fired power plants will, which, which will emit an estimated 150 million tonnes of carbon dioxide. At Glasgow, Prime Minister Modi of India announced that by 2030, India will reduce its total projected carbon emissions by 1 billion tonnes and meet half of its energy requirements with renewable fuels and also pledge to reach net zero emissions by 2070. Other developing countries do not have the luxury of well-off countries such as the EU's by buying cheap offset credits to reduce their emissions. They require solutions that are inexpensive, that provide reliable power and that materially reduce their emissions. And that's why the Morrison government's technology investment roadmap is so important. This government's roadmap is a plan to accelerate new te technologies like hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, batteries, healthy sto soils that will help reduce emissions here and around the world. So far, we have committed to invest $20 billion in new energy technologies by 2030 to drive at least $80 billion of total public and private investment over the decade. This investment will support at least 160,000 new jobs. This roadmap is clearly working. Over the last two years, our position against our 2030 target has improved by 639 million tonnes. This is the equivalent of taking all of Australia's 14.7 million cars off the road for 15 years. So while those of us that are happy to stand up and make statements and make them feel good and look good on social media, this government is working on delivering actual results that not only reduces our emissions, but also drives investment and economic growth. We are about taking action, not making statements. Thousands of jobs will be created by 2050 by the creation of an Australian hydrogen industry. And this follows on very nicely from the, the work that has been done over recent decades on building an LNG industry. The amount of investment, some government, mostly private, that built that industry will go a long way to create, that's created markets 
that Australia will follow on, that we will transition to selling hydrogen into when those markets transition away from, um, from natural gas. Regional hydrogen hubs that we are building in regional Australia will help develop the industry and create jobs. Our priority is to produce clean hydrogen under $2 a kilo. Low-cost clean hydrogen holds significant promise for the world's energy future, and Australia has what it takes to be the, that world leader in hydrogen, just like we did with LNG. Our government's $1.2 billion hydrogen investment is set to increase boosting economic activity and jobs in regional Australia. An additional $150 million for a further two locations under the Clean Hydrogen Industrial Hubs program will enable the rollout of hydrogen hub hubs across seven priority regional sites. Hubs will consolidate Australia's natural resource strengths to unlock cheap, clean energy and stimulate a potential surge in industrial activity. An Australian hydrogen industry could generate more than 8,000 jobs and deliver over $11 billion a year in GDP by 2050. The research that's going on will help um, lead the creation of those hydrogen hubs and industry, where we will then reach our goal of producing green hydrogen below $2 a kilo. And our aim is to accelerate this process so that clean hydrogen achieves parity with other energy fuel sources that give us firm power uh, in the quickest possible way. The Morrison government has a plan. We took that plan to, to the last election. We took it to Glasgow. We're meeting and beating that plan. We're meeting and, ble meeting and beating our emissions targets, and we will continue to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Van. Senator Ayres. Well, thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, the Morrison government doesn't have a plan. It's got a pamphlet. It's got a different, it's got a different plan uh, every few months. It always changes. It's a plan. That, that lacks ambition and lacks capability uh, and lacks the things that Australians need uh, to have confidence in the government. Mr Albanese uh, has indicated all the way through this term that following the Glasgow conference uh, and following the government finally releasing what passes for modelling that uh, Mr Albanese and Mr Bowen will set out for the electorate precisely the climate and energy framework uh, that will deliver a credible approach to Australia's position on climate and energy, uh, and that will come uh, soon. And he will do it. Uh, he's indicated that it will happen, and it will happen. It is something that the government has singularly failed to do uh, over the course of the last eight long, eight going on nine long years of failure and ineptitude. With all the resources of government, they have failed. I suppose in some respects they have succeeded. They have had not one policy framework but 21, a hodgepodge of mutually opposed, utterly contradictory, befuddled and shambolic policy offerings. That's why we're last in the OECD. And it's only a Labor government that will deliver a credible policy framework in climate and energy. Uh, Labor, Labor's climate and energy policy, when it's released, will be directed towards the following national objectives. Number one, reducing electricity and energy prices for Australian households and businesses. Two, reducing our emissions profile, Australia's emissions contribution, uh, in order to importantly reduce our contribution, but also to try and restore Australian credibility around the world that has been so utterly trashed by this government. Three, it'll be about driving investment in good jobs in new good jobs, permanent jobs, not bodgy labour hire jobs, not casual jobs, but real jobs in our industrial suburbs and in our regions and in our cities. 
and we'll do that by having lower reliable electricity and energy prices, in making improvements in reliability and capacity to the grid, with investments in capability, with expansions in mining and mining technology uh, and in other uh, efforts to try and push Australian exports up the value chain. Our contribution in the National Reconstruction Fund and the Rewiring the Nation funds, already announced, will be the biggest single policy contribution of any Australian government at rebuilding and reindustrialising our regions. That's what we'll do if we're elected. It's a solemn commitment to the regions and our, and our industrial suburbs. Uh, it will have a real material uh, uh, effect on our ambitions profile, and it will finally be, from an Australian government, a credible commitment on climate and energy. Now, if you vote for the government, you won't get that. If you vote for the Greens political party, you won't get that. You'll undermine that. If you vote for the National Party or One Nation, the only way you'll make progress on climate and energy and on jobs in the regions is by voting for the Labor Party. It is a critical national objective. There's no wedge, no political games, no tricks, no clever politics, no marketing, no spin, nobody left out, nobody left behind. It is a critical national objective for our economy, for our society, for our environment and to protect jobs. If you want real action on climate and energy, if you want lower power prices, if you really care about blue-collar jobs beyond dressing up as a blue-collar worker, if you want more industry and a better environment, then vote for it. Then vote for it. If Australians waste votes on them or them, that will undermine the capacity for change. It puts us further behind in the race for jobs and opportunity. Because unlike the bloke who currently leads the government, Albo will do what he says and say what he means and will deliver. Sorry, sorry, uh, Senator Ayres. Uh, Senator Davey on a point of order. I think we are advised not to refer to people from the other place by their nicknames. If, and will if, do. if we could refer to, to members of the other place by their thanks. correct titles, thank you, Senator. Thanks, thanks very much. Because on our side we've got party discipline, a strength of purpose, a common commitment, and we've demonstrated that. One message, not 12 messages, not like Mr Morrison, who says one thing in, in Glasgow and says something entirely different in Gladstone. Or Senator Canavan, who says that we should put aside $250 billion of public money to directly fund projects that commercial lenders won't fund. Or his mate, Mr Pitt, who supports this but doesn't say it anymore because he wants to protect the only job that he cares about, his own, in the Cabinet. Now, Senator Canavan, in a rare moment of clarity, said that he knows that that policy that he supports and that Mr Pitt supports will push up mortgage interest rates and increase the cost of borrowing for businesses. But that's OK, apparently. Home mortgage costs up by what? $50 a month, $80 a month, a couple hundred dollars a month? This is a reverse scare campaign. It's Senator Canavan who's wandering around the country telling Australians and Australian businesses that his policy framework is going to push interest rates up. When wages are going down year after year in the longest sustained period of zero wage growth, household incomes are going down, Senator Canavan wants to push mortgage interest rates up. He thinks ordinary Australians can find a couple of hundred dollars every month 
to fund his ideological frivolity. I want to go from a former Trotskyite to the bunch of current Trots and faded university politicians over here. That cavalcade to Queensland symbolised everything that's wrong with this self-indulgent, self-defeating narcissism that defines the Greens' political party today. What's their real target for 2022? 10 per cent. Their real target's 10 per cent. 10 per cent of Australian voters is the only thing that they care about. They don't care about the climate. They don't care about the, the, they only care about themselves. It's been a long time. Both Senator Canavan and the Greens need each other. Political polarisation suits them because that's their business model. There's no progress with the Greens' political party. I mean, save me. These people who come in here talk about the old parties, they say. They've been here for 37 years in Australian, in, in Australian parliaments. 37 years the Greens have been turning up in Australian parliaments. You know how many national parks they've delivered? Zero. How, many, how much impact on species extinction has the Greens' political party had? Zero. Not a, not a kilogram of carbon, not a kilogram of carbon has been emitted or not emitted or taken out of the atmosphere because of the activity of the Greens political party. It's just narcissism and noise and seats. That's all they're interested in. Pretend progressives who haven't learned, who haven't changed. It's the same stunts, the tired, boring, irrelevant stunts. 10 per cent of the primary vote is all that they care about. They are not part of the solution. They are part of the problem if you care about climate change and if you care about real action on climate. Thank you, Senator Ayres. We have Senator Roberts remotely. Senator Roberts. Senator Roberts, we can't hear you at the moment. I'm sorry. Senator Roberts, we can't hear you. No, nope, still can't hear you. And can, oh, you hear me, can you hear me now? I can hear you now, Senator Roberts. Please proceed. Thank you. Despite harming the Aboriginal people in many ways, the Greens dishonestly and falsely pretend to care for Aboriginals. In pushing Greens policies ripening in 2030, the Greens are in fact pushing Australia down the UN's Agenda 2030 path. For example, Consider something as basic as land rights and land use before we get on to the Glasgow distraction. It's not immediately obvious that the United Nations globalist strategy significantly influenced Australia's Native Title Act that pretends to give Aboriginal people access to land, yet actually limits and in many ways prevents all Australians, including Aboriginals, from using the land, even accessing the land. My recent listening across Cape York, all Cape York communities in far north Queensland, confirmed yet again many Aboriginal and European community leaders' dissatisfaction at the reality and impact of Native Title legislation. The Native Title Act's preamble refers many times to United Nations principles. When a claim is successful under Native Title, individuals find that they are prevented from owning their own home within the area of the claim and face impediments in raising money for business loans for lack of collateral. In practical terms, the rights of Aboriginal people and their lives have not been improved under the Native Title Act. So having said that, let's look at the other policy that the Greens have raised here. The United Nations actually drives the Glasgow agenda. Let's look at that more closely because it lacks substance, as do the Labor Greens coalition climate and energy policies and the Liberal Nationals coalition climate and energy policies. Contradictions erupt and abound in climate and energy policies because no politician has ever provided the logical scientific points as evidence for those policies. John Howard, his government, introduced the abominable re renewable energy target and he stole, his government stole farmers' property rights to use their own property. Yet six years after being booted from office in 2007, 
He confessed in London in 2013 that on climate science he is agnostic. He had no science. The whole thing was driven just on whims and, and fairy tales. He had no science to support what has become the gutting of our electricity sector and our productive capacity. In 2016, the father of the Senate, Ian MacDonald, said there's never been a debate on the climate science, and he is correct, and there still hasn't been one. Two months ago, 10 federal parliamentarians confirmed in writing to me that they have never been provided with the scientific evidence they, and they have the integrity and courage to say so. In August last year, 19 federal parliamentarians and the Greens, Labor, Liberal, Nationals parties failed to provide me, and they were all advocating climate alarm and climate policies, failed to provide me with any scientific evidence for their claims. In 2007, coming to the Labor Party, and 2008, Kevin Rudd claimed 4,000 scientists support the claim that carbon dioxide from human activity affects climate and needs to be cut. The UN IPCC, the climate body in the UN, own data shows that only five endorse the claim, and there's doubt they were even scientists. And the Greens, instead of science, have a well-worn trick of using emotional stories and have never produced the evidence. There is no basis for these policies, and with that, the UN is driving it in this country. Freedom of information requests and parliamentary research, parliamentary library research, revealed to me no evidence for this. So here we have the Labor Greens Coalition pushing this, this, and it hurts who the most? It hurts the people who are poorest, the people thank who are you, not Thank you, Senator Roberts. Down. Your time has expired. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. I, I welcome uh, the opportunity to debate this motion because, because uh, I have, uh, I must confess, I have felt a, a hole uh, in my life since the Glasgow Climate Conference ended. Uh, it was uh, the best comedy I have seen for decades. Uh, it was a laugh a minute. Uh, uh, I was waiting on bated breath for most of the, uh, the agenda. And ever since its end, it's a bit like the Olympics ending. You know, there's, just, there's nothing to watch on TV anymore. Nothing really comes up to scratch. Or, or, or one of the highlights was, uh, I think it was day 42 or something, it was the Gender Innovation Science Day. Oh, I know Senator Dunningham was uh, watching that one strongly. That was, a, that, was a, that was a cracker. That was an absolute cracker. But it was mainly the participants at Glasgow that made it what it was. It was the people that went along there, uh, and we must all, uh, uh, we all owe them a, a, a debt of gratitude. I loved the, during Glasgow, I loved the, this one. One of my favourites was the headline. Um, I think it was a Reuters story. A headline said, German Greens want more Russian gas. <laughs> German Greens. What more Russian gas? Uh, well, you know, um, it sums it up. It sums it up, doesn't it? The, the, the green activists, they like to talk the talk. They love to talk the talk. But when it comes to walk the walk, they still want to be able to heat their homes. They still want to be able to fly to these climate conferences and they'll use fossil fuels as much as they can to get it. They just really don't want the gas coming from Australia or the gas coming from their own countries. They like it to come from dictatorial uh, regimes like Mr Putin's or, or indeed the Chinese Communist Party who we'll get to. Another favourite another favorite was uh, BBC Scotland. BBC Scotland tweeted this during the, the Glasgow conference. They tweeted, Gas and air is the most popular pain relief in childbirth, but many don't realise its climate impact. That's what they tweeted. They tweeted it. Now, I've had five children. I don't think I'll be going to a delivery suite again. But for all those listening who may, uh, particularly the blokes out there, who may one day find themselves in the delivery suite, suite trying, to, uh, trying to give comfort to uh, their wife, um, I just make a suggestion. It's probably best not to say to your wife in that circumstances, look, I know this is tough, honey, but we must think of the planet. I don't think that would be a smart idea. I don't think you should do that. No one is going to do this. How absurd are these guys? How absurd is the United Nations who say, who say that we can only eat to save the planet? We're only allowed to eat now 14 grams of red meat a week. A week. 14 grams a week. So if you're, any of us here are going down to the Kingston Hotel and, and having a 400-gram having a rump, or so uh, this fortnight. Just remember, that's about you're a little bit over your, your allocation for the month. That's it. That's it. That's it for you. No more red meat for the month if you care about the planet. Uh, otherwise, you are an environmental vandal. You're a criminal, in fact. You're absolutely a criminal. But we can't, I, can't, I can't go through this contribution without paying tribute to the, to the, to the greatest entertainer Australia has exported for some time, uh, Mr Twiggy Forrest. Mr Twiggy Forrest was over there 
and he was getting some pressure, I suppose, about the fact that President Xi Jinping had not attended the Glasgow conference. And he, 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 he responded by saying that he was going to try and convince, uh, unsuccessfully as it turned out, but he was going to try and convince Mr Xi Jinping to come along uh, to Glasgow, to come to the conference, because he, he said uh, Mr Forrest was reported as saying that, uh, from what he sees happening in China, the younger generation have a very strong will to have a carbon neutral power. And he goes on to say, he went on to say, Mr. Forrest went on to say that, and one thing which the Chinese government is incredibly good at doing is listening to the mood of its people. That's what he said. He listening to the mood of his of its people. Now, I, I actually agree with Mr. Forrest on this. I agree uh, with Twiggy on this one because I, I ask you, I ask you, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, when has been, when is the last time? You heard a person living in China complain about their own government. It doesn't happen. <laughs> you do this stuff, you never hear about it. It's just, it's just not happening. So they must be doing a fantastic job because there are no complaints coming out of China. Mr. Forrest is absolutely right. How absurd are these guys? These are the people who want to tell us what to do, who want to dictate our lives, who want to tell us what to eat, tell us what car we can drive, tell us how we can power our home. And they have done all this work, all this work. And I don't know if the Greens stayed around for the end of Glasgow. They must have missed the ending of it because this motion, this motion says that because of the Glasgow conference, we must, we're not allowed to, 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 uh, to, uh, to, to approve new coal mines uh, or build new gas facilities. Uh, that's not actually how it ended. That's not how it ended. How it ended, how it ended was that it actually ended in tears. The whole thing ended in tears, literal tears. It was crying because India had the temerity to want to develop and grow the same way other industrialised economies have done, have done. So they demanded that no, in fact, coal mines should be allowed. The coal-fired power should still be allowed. Uh, it only should be reduced over time. Uh, they did. There was no mention of gas being ruled out completely. So nothing about the approval of the Scarborough, Pro Scarborough project is inconsistent with Glasgow. And this motion simply shows that the people over there are either not watching Glasgow or are too mentally scarred by it that they have already repressed the experience from their memory. Because ever since Glasgow, ever since Glasgow, it's been a huge win, huge win uh, for oil and gas. Ever since the end of it, there's been nothing but good news for the workers in this country that work in this great coal industry that we are lucky enough to have, that work in the oil and gas industry. It has been a cavalcade of great news for them. We of course heard that's already been mentioned here. We have heard that we've had the approval of the massive $16.5 billion Scarborough project. Over 3,000 Australian jobs, 3,000 jobs uh, for people from this country uh, will be able to work thanks to the approval of that project. That's gone ahead. They've, got, they've attracted $16.5 billion of investment. We're constantly told no one will build coal mines or gas fields. Well, they're doing that there. Since Glasgow, we've had the headline. Headline. This one is in Reuters. Uh, saying China doubles down on a slower coal exit after COP26 spat. So China's building more coal. They're building, building more coal, building more. It's a green light for coal under this Glasgow agreement. We've had one of the more remarkable things, actually, one of the remarkable things, we've had the Dutch government, a, a very green government. They were committed to a, to a stronger Glasgow agreement that ended up coming out. But the Dutch government, since Glasgow, are now, are now focused on uh, desperately trying to keep uh, a little company called Shell headquartered in Amsterdam. So what are they doing? They are, they are offering Shell uh, a tax cut of 15 per cent to keep them in the Netherlands. And so they go to Glasgow, fly over there on presumably their private jet, or at least it's got to be fossil fuel jet, uh, say they all wanted to go green, go back home, go back home. Uh, uh, to, to the lo lovely su su surrounds of Amsterdam and are giving tax cuts to big oil companies because they, well, guess what, they want jobs too. I'm sure the Dutch government want jobs too. And, and finally, we've seen since Glasgow, since Glasgow, this headline: U.S. coal prices surged to the highest point since 2009, the highest point in over 12 years. Uh, uh, let's go, Brandon. Indeed, because this is meaning this, 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 this restriction of coal, of oil, of gas, is pushing up fossil fuel prices to their record levels uh, that we've ever seen, because there is significant demand for fossil fuels around the world. And I want to finish on making a very important point that relates back to the Scarborough project. Uh, this is a project that will produce uh, oil and will produce a lot of gas, 
And there are a lot of things that come from those products that I think the average Australian doesn't, doesn't understand. It is not just the heating for homes uh, or what you put in your petrol tank. It creates a whole raft of other, pro uh, other products that our modern economy relies on. One of the sadder news, saddest pieces of news since Glasgow has been that Intertech Pivot, an Australian company, has announced that it will close the last urea manufacturing facility in Australia. Urea is the most important fertiliser used in agricultural production. It is by far the most uh, fertiliser that is used in this dry continent, and we would not be able to grow the same amount of food that we do without it. Now we will be completely reliant on imports for our urea fertilisers. Urea, urea comes from natural gas. You cannot make urea without natural gas. It is the carbon dioxide in the urea that activates the plant growth and allows us to grow things in this, in this world. Now You never hear that from these so-called experts on the oil and gas industry that like to say a lot about an industry that they know very little about, that they talk to no one in, and they just want to shut it down, not knowing the consequences for average Australians. This is not just about the workers uh, in that industry. It's not just about the royalties that help pay our hospitals and schools. It is about our basic ability to feed ourselves as a country, to power ourselves as a country, and ultimately, ultimately to defend ourselves as a country. Because if we shut down all of the oil and gas and coal uh, production here in this country, we know the Greens, as I've said, the Greens will still want the products. They'll still want to eat. They'll still want to fly. They'll still want to, to be able to heat their homes. They will instead import all those products from other regimes who don't do that, like China, like Russia, and will become more dependent on them. To defend this country, we need to support our resources industry, including coal, oil and gas. Thank you, Senator Canavan. Senator Grogan. Thank you. Let's be clear. The only way to get a good climate policy, or any climate policy for that matter, is to change the government. Moving away from fossil fuel requires an effective energy transition, and we have an incredible renewable future ahead of us, but only a Labor government will deliver this and will deliver Australia's potential as a renewable energy superpower, reduce emissions, reduce energy prices and deliver the industry and jobs growth that can be a serious part of addressing climate change. We all remember when the Greens teamed up with Tony Abbott in 2009 to sink Australia's best chance at lasting climate action, and we are still reeling from that now. Had the Greens supported real action on climate change back then, Australia would be in a much better position today. The coalition's decade of delay has already cost thousands of new energy jobs and is setting Australia up for failure. The government's approach to this critical climate conference in Glasgow was just plain embarrassing. Rather than digging deep to commit to a plan for transition, the Prime Minister spent most of his trip to Glasgow in a diplomatic incident with France and being accused by President Macron of lying. Morrison had to be dragged kicking and screaming to the most basic commitment, a target of net zero emissions by 2050. And then he voluntarily signed an international agreement to revisit the 2030 targets at the end of the COP, but a few hours later said he wouldn't. Liberal inaction, chaos and lies has left Australia behind the game in terms of economic opportunities. In contrast, Labor sees the world's climate emergency as Australia's jobs opportunity. We should be fighting at the front of this emergency, not whinging at the back of the pack. I'm proud to represent South Australia in this place, and under the Weatherall government, our state took the need to transition to renewables very seriously. We became a world leader in renewables and in building a low carbon economy. There are so many projects in South Australia, particularly in regional South Australia, projects such as the Hornsdale Wind Farm and the proposed Port Augusta Renewable Energy Project, which is combining wind and solar and bringing together a clean energy generation capacity of 320 megawatts. The South Australian Big Battery the list of projects goes on. What it takes is a government that believes and a government that will commit to the economic development to address climate change 
and build jobs. South Australia has shown that a transition away from fossil fuels and towards clean, renewable energy is possible, and it unlocks the economic opportunities and a pipeline of secure, well-paid, clean energy jobs. And that is the pathway that an Albanese Labor government will also take. But time is running out when we are desperately in need of a government that will take this emergency seriously that will actually take serious action on well-balanced policies to make a fundamental difference to the future of this country. I want to acknowledge that part of this uh, motion uh, talks about the rights of First Nations people in relation to climate action. And can I say that First Nations people are critical to the process of responding to the climate emergency. From their deep knowledge of land management the enormous leadership that they have shown, the commitment to balancing human needs with environmental needs and their inherent connection to the land and the understanding um, of how the climate operates and how the seasons operate and how to protect that land. First Nations voices are vital to the process. And clearly, they are calling out for better engagement and a stronger voice in responding to this existential threat to their country. The only option we have to address climate change and build a better future for this country, which includes building our economic strength, is to change the government. Those opposite and those on the corner have no hope. It is only a Labor government that is going to deliver us a decent outcome and address climate change. Thank you, Senator. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. It was only yesterday that I stood up here to remind this place that climate crisis is being caused by a failure to listen to and act on the advice, knowledge, science and wisdom of First Nations people in this country. And not to mention Indigenous people around the world, particularly from countries that are still recovering from colonisation. First Nations people here and around the world have a role to play in preventing climate change and economic destruction, and that role is as leaders. For over 350 million First Nations and Indigenous people around the world, climate change will impact our homelands early and more severely. It's already happening in this country. This isn't some sort of hypothetical situation or something that is going to happen in the distant future. It's actually happening now. Today I stood out the front of this building to be in solidarity with traditional owners from what we now call the Beedaloo Basin. And I'd like to use the rest of my time to read their open letter and quote from them. I quote, We speak as traditional owners and custodians of and around the lands and waters that you call the Beedaloo and Connected Basins. Although we come from many nations, we have come together to put an end to the ongoing threat of fracking on our countries, which will denigrate and desecrate our lands. We know our country, we read it, we understand it, and we alone speak for it and its song lines. It is our birthright handed down by bloodline. Together, we fight for it. Our connections to country have been established and proven time and time again by the white man's law. We hold native title and land rights, a system that is meant to protect and enforce our rights. These have been denied to us. Our connections to country have been established and proven time and time again by the white man's law. We hold native title and land rights. And for years, we've been told lies by the gas and oil corporations that there would be no damage to the country or poison in our waters. These companies won't even answer the most basic of questions where they plan to drill or how many wells they want to build. 
These gas corporations lack any respect for us traditional owners. They have failed to follow proper process in consultation with us, failed to acquire consent, failed to acquire consent, failed to provide transparency in their dealings with us, and have systematically excluded our voices from the decision-making process for activities on our country. We don't have the same resources as these corporations. The system is already set up against us. This federal government coming in over the top of what little processes we have undermines our land rights as Northern Territory traditional owners. The same government who has never come out to our communities to sit with us or meet with us. They are failing to represent us. Giving $50 million to mining corporations for an economic recovery to start drilling will only line the pockets of huge corporations who want to take more than we're willing to give. It does nothing but hurt us, our communities and our country. What about our recovery? The money to finally fulfil the empty promises of proper housing in our communities or resourcing the health services we've been calling for for years? And what about country's recovery? Country's water is the blood that flows through our body and it is already poisoned. Where is the money to clean the water many Northern Territory communities are forced to drink? This is short-term money that will cause long-term pain. So division and damage country and community. We will not allow you to cause any more pain, any more hurt or division in our communities. Hear us when we say we won't allow fracking gas fields on our country, not now, not ever. We are united. This is our land and we're ready to do whatever it takes to protect country. Don't frack the NT. Don't frack the order, NT. Order, order, Don't order, frack the NT. Order, the thought. Senator Thorpe, you know perfectly well that props are not allowed. You continue, continue to flout the rules of, of, of this chamber. Please don't do that. Thank you. I call Senator Lyons. Have you, have you finished? No. Okay. Right. I, I, okay. Well, I'll, get, I'll return the call to you then, Senator Thorpe. And I hope that you can adhere to the standing orders. I will adhere to the standing orders, and I'll put my prop away. So thank you. Uh, but I just hope that people in this place listen to that very, very clear letter from Northern Territory traditional owners. If you can't do that then please take your dot paintings down. Thank you. Uh, I call Senator Lyons. Uh, thank you, Deputy, Acting Deputy President. Uh, coincidentally, earlier today I participated in an online event titled Women's Voices – Action for Change. This was a powerful discussion about achieving First Nations gender justice and equality. And it started with Australia's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner, June Oscar, who provided us with an overview of her landmark report, We Young and You Fungi, Women's Voices. <clears throat> this motion today is about the urgency of the Glasgow Climate Pact and reminds us in implementing the pact of respecting, promoting and considering First Nations people when taking actions to address climate change. We Yang and You Fungi takes a gender lens to all aspects of life, including climate justice. It starts with the premise that Aboriginal women are the backbone of caring for children 
and family and caring for country. In relationship to this matter, the fundamental strengths of First Nation women are linked right back to first mothers. And to quote uh, Commissioner Oscar, who went on to say that for too long the door has been closed and decisions are made about our lives um, without First Nations women being in the room. <clears throat> if the government is serious about addressing climate change, and that's a big if because it has got a backbench full of uh, climate sceptics, and if it's really serious about limiting global temperatures to 1.5 degrees again, which I very much doubt, it must include First Nations women, people, particularly women. As Commissioner Oscar says, what we know matters. What we've seen, though, is policy development on the run. In the weeks leading up to the Glasgow summit, the government um, it was still lying about um, what it had achieved and what it would achieve in relation to meeting our Paris targets. We have a Prime Minister who can't even be honest about what he said during the last election about electric vehicles. We have a Prime Minister and a government who have signed up to technologies that are not yet invented. We have a government who is absolutely captured by its climate science denying backbenchers and two members of the Pauline Hanson party who they rely on this place week after week to get their legislation passed. And we have a government that's too afraid to bring legislation into this place because it's being held to ransom by up to five uh, of its own senators, and we saw that in action on Monday. The only way to achieve real action on climate change is to change the government and to elect a Labor government, because Labor believes that net zero emissions by 2050 is necessary but not sufficient. We need a road map right now that will get us there, not something that's made up and predicated on technologies that haven't even been invented yet. This is what an Albanese Labor government will achieve. Our climate ambition will be backed by costed policies to achieve that ambition. Good climate policy is good jobs policy, creating jobs and cutting power prices while reducing emissions. The regions will be at the centre of Labor's climate and energy policies. The only way to achieve that is through changing this government. They're tired. They've had eight years of nothing. Uh, in the weeks leading up to Glasgow was the only time we saw a policy that they won't tell us how much it's going to cost, that has no real targets, that actually doesn't have too many policies which are currently being able to be delivered right now. We have a Prime Minister who last election and uh, could not tell the truth about, uh, or now can't tell the truth, what he said about electric vehicles. We all know it's on video. You know, it was going to ruin your weekend, and now he's denying he ever said that. We've got a government that's committed to just re-electing itself, devoid of policies, is leading us nowhere on climate change and, quite frankly, needs to be sacked by Australian voters at the next election. And I will take great pleasure in campaigning as hard as I can to get rid of the Morrison government, a government devoid of ideas, a government who lies about what it might do and what it's done and doesn't deserve to be in government. Thank you, Senator Lyons. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
down and just let it rip. The bells. The question is that the urgency motion moved by Senator Cox be agreed to. The eyes will move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left, and I appoint Senator McKim, teller for the eyes, and Senator Ciccone, the teller for the, the nose. I think Senator McKim. The only excuse is you were texting your mother or something, was it? Yes. Right.
The result of the division is ayes 7, noes 25. The question is resolved in the negative. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I ask senators to uh, leave the chamber uh, if they're not staying for the consideration of documents. So we are proceeding to the consideration of documents. The list, they're listed on page four of today's order of business. Is anyone seeking the call?